January is supposed to be a chill time in the games industry. Not much going on, an opportunity for me to sit back, relax, catch up on my backlog, but no, not this year. We got smacked with a new IP announcement from Blizzard. They're making a survival game, apparently. Lost Ark will be launching with some of its tier three content, meaning we'll have a whole lot of game to play on day one. And the Elder Scrolls Online revealed their content lineup schedule for 2022. We also learned that Final Fantasy XIV plans to have another 10 years of support. Guild Wars 2's End of Dragons expansion is launching in February, we just don't know exactly when. There are multiple Star Wars games in development at EA, and I'm going to touch on the huge Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard news. We also have quite a few more other interesting stories here in today's episode. So yes, jam-packed video for you today, lots to dive into, but before we do, let's get a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Ridge Wallet. These are compact, durable wallets designed to help you streamline what you carry around. I've had one myself for the past few months and can tell you it, in fact, did that. I used to have one of the bulky leather wallets, you know, the things uh, just always loaded with stuff, not money, you know, just like people's business cards, old receipts napkins sometimes. I don't know. Anyway, now I just carry my handful of essentials and that's all. It is way more compact and takes up way less space. Besides its size, some of the main features of the Ridge Wallet are that it can hold up to 12 cards while still having room for cash. It's also made of durable materials, has a 45-day risk-free trial, as well as a lifetime warranty. It's also got RFID blocking tech to protect against digital pickpocketers, and they are offered in over 30 different colors and styles for you to choose from. So if you're you're interested in checking out the Ridge Wallet for yourself, there is a link in the description below and using the code FORCE will get you 10% off your order. All right, now let's go ahead and jump into this week's PC gaming news. There's a brand new game in the works at Blizzard Entertainment. It's being described as a survival title for PC and consoles set in a whole new universe, or in other words, outside of Blizzard's existing franchises. Although the fact that they're developing a new game was revealed, this wasn't an official reveal of that game per se. We didn't get a name, we didn't get much more than a couple of bits of concept art. This is more of a call for people to work on it. They have numerous positions currently available in the art, design, and engineering teams making this unannounced survival game. Outside of that, any further details are pretty vague. The website says that this is a place full of heroes, we have yet to meet, stories yet to be told, and adventures yet to be lived, a vast realm of possibility waiting to be explored. Now beyond cheeky comments like, hey, working at Blizzard, is kind of like a survival game. It does feel like the air around this announcement has been a bit lukewarm, and I think for good reason. After all, Blizzard doesn't hold the same position it did even five years ago with the gaming community. They were once considered one of the premier developers for PC games. That's just no longer the case. I know personally, between the slew of reports of terrible work conditions, harassment, and poor treatment of employees, and just the decline in quality of of their products, be it poor design or just outright broken releases, I'm finding it really hard to get excited about this reveal. If you had told me five, six, seven years ago that Blizzard was making a brand new game, I most certainly would have just like lost my mind with excitement. Hell, at one point, I probably would have just devoted my entire YouTube channel to covering that game. I've in fact done that very thing numerous times in the 11 plus years I've been on this platform. But those days are over um, for one, because I no longer feel the desire to devote my channel to a single game, but also because I just don't really feel that way about Blizzard or their games any longer. I did grow up on Blizzard games, StarCraft, WarCraft, and Diablo all hold a special place in my heart. The fun times I've had playing in those worlds over the years cannot be replaced, but they also don't give the company a free pass for the rest of my existence. If Blizzard wants me to be excited about the things that they're making, they need to start making things worth being excited for. So good luck, Blizzard. I hope you are able to start making great games again. And I hope you're able to do that without making the lives of the people making those games miserable. Amazon revealed some new key details about what content will be available at the start of Lost Ark's Western release. The biggest takeaway is that they'll be launching with a portion of the game's tier three content. This includes tier three zones, dungeons, and raids, along with the gear and upgrade materials you get for doing them. This news has been met with 
let's just call it a mixed reaction. On one hand, some people are excited as this means more content available right from the start, giving players more stuff to do. As we know, running out of things to do too quickly is a major pain point for any new MMO releasing, and one of the main reasons people tend to abandon games in this genre. Now that we know some of Tier 3 will be available at launch, we are certain to be quite busy and not lacking for content. With that said, Lost Ark doesn't exactly lack in things to keep us busy, even in those first few tiers. There's just so much account progression, places to explore, currencies to gather, but anyway. Now, on the other hand, launching with Tier 3 also means that progressing through Tiers 1 and 2 will likely be far more accelerated as players rush towards unlocking and running Tier 3. I've also seen people raise concerns over what this could do to the game's economy, with experienced players getting to Tier 3 as fast as possible, and then flooding the market with the materials that other players will need for upgrading their gear. At least at first, it did seem like that second take was the predominant opinion from what I was reading and seeing online. Many people appear to wish their tier three would come at a later date, maybe one or two months down the road, just to give players some room to breathe and experience those first two tiers and get used to the multitude of systems and stuff in this game. And I get it. Uh, like I said, even in just those first two tiers, there's so damn much to see and do in Lost Ark. Like it already feels almost overwhelming as a new player. I'm about a hundred hours into the game playing on the Russian servers and then preview servers. And I still feel like I've just gotten started and like I barely know what's going on. Now I have read that one of the major reasons for the decision to launch with tier 3 is Smilegate's desire to introduce that harder endgame content of Legion raids as soon as possible, which I think is ultimately a wise decision. While I would love to just chill out in tiers 1 and 2, level up and try different classes, and then farm some account progression, I also know that at the end of the day, Legion raids are one of the more interesting type of endgame PvE activities, so deciding to give us our first taste of that as soon as possible is probably a good decision, as I could see people growing tired of just running daily chaos dungeons, guardian raids, and abyssal dungeons. They are fun, but rather simple content. Anyway, we will see what comes of all of this. I honestly don't know what the right answer is here, and I am curious what some more experienced Lost Ark players think. The 2022 content release schedule for Elder Scrolls Online has finally been revealed. As predicted with that teaser cinematic from a few weeks back, this year of updates will center around the Bretons, and as per usual, will be broken up into three DLCs and one major chapter. The first DLC, Ascending Tide, launches on March 14th and introduces two new four-player PvE dungeons, along with new item sets and collectibles. Then, on June 6th, we'll be getting the High Isle chapter. This is the largest update of the year, and will include a new zone, the Islands of High Isle and Aminos, a new main story quest line all about the legacy of the Bretons, an in-game collectible card game that they call Tales of Tribute, a new 12-player trial, Dreadsail Reef, two new companions, new world events called Fissures, new delves, public dungeons, world bosses, a host of standalone quests, along with various other updates and quality of life improvements. And then in quarter three, we will be getting our second dungeon DLC and quarter four brings some additional story DLC. Now this follows along the standard content rollout that Elder Scrolls Online has had for some years now. It is really cool to see that the game has continued to get sizable updates year after year, although it would be nice if they had some more substantial additions in the form of like new skill lines or new classes. For the most part, these yearly updates boil down to just getting some new areas to explore, some new quests, and a couple of more end game activities. Regardless, though, I've really enjoyed playing Elder Scrolls Online in the past, and I have every intention of revisiting the game again, hopefully this year. I do still need to check out that 2021 Gates of Oblivion update on top of all of this new stuff, so there's lots for me to see. Um, but it's a fun game, especially I think as someone who likes both Elder Scrolls and MMOs. Looks like we can expect Final Fantasy XIV to be around for at least another decade. As you likely know, the game has seen quite a bit of growth recently, culminating in the launch of an expansion so popular they had to stop selling it and have continued to have server issues uh, more than a month after launch. In a recent Square Enix livestream, director and producer Yoshi P touched on some upcoming changes and plans for the future. In February, they'll be revealing the post-launch content roadmap for Endwalker, then 
in March, there's going to be a preview of the major content patch 6.1, which is likely to include a new main story quest, alliance raid, trial, and job changes. And then finally of note, Yoshi P mentioned that he has every intention of continuing to work on Final Fantasy XIV for the next 10 years, and that they've been busy planning some of what's to come. With the trajectory that the game has had in recent years, this seems totally plausible. Final Fantasy XIV continues to grow, get more expansions, and possibly an overhaul? Question <laughs> mark. Uh, I know that I would love to see this game get an engine or graphical update. As with many MMOs that have been around for over 10 years, Final Fantasy XIV does look quite dated in a lot of ways. Not that it's held it back at all, clearly, but I still think an updated look would be nice. You know, MMOs are really their own special breed in this regard, though. Uh, they don't have to look great to be loved, as the systems world and gameplay are far more important. Uh, also of note here is that the game is finally back on sale again as of this week. The base version is available for $20 and the recent Endwalker expansion for $40. The upcoming End of Dragons expansion for Guild Wars 2 is set to release this February, although as of this recording, we still don't have a release date. This past week, they revealed their pre-launch live stream schedule plans. On February 4th, they'll be giving a tour of the new major city. Then on the 11th, they will be previewing the Jade Tech Mastery. On the 18th, they're going to have a music preview. And then it just says here that in late February, there will be a launch day celebration stream. Uh, notice, of course, that a launch day doesn't have an actual date. Uh, I think it's a little nuts here that we're presumably a month or less from a new major expansion releasing, but we still don't have an actual day set in stone. Maybe that's just the thing, though. Maybe they're coming in hot with this development of this expansion and they're holding off on announcing anything that they would have to later delay. Or maybe they're just kind of feeling the month out a bit. After all, February is shaping up to be quite a busy one for new releases. On the MMO front alone, of course, we have Lost Ark coming, which as of now seems primed to be one of the biggest games in this genre that's scheduled to release in 2022. So I don't really blame them if they're wanting to distance themselves from that, maybe see how it goes, see what people think after a couple of weeks, and then respond with their launch accordingly. I know for a lot a lot of people though, having a launch date ahead of time is kind of important for anyone who wants to take time off work or any other obligations they uh, to enjoy those first few days of the expansion. And for the most part, a lot of times they need more than a week or two of a heads up. Regardless though, here we are just a few days from February and still no release date. Although EA's exclusive use of the Star Wars IP has come to an end, they apparently still have multiple games in the works. In a blog post on their website, they revealed there are three separate titles currently in development. There is Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order 2, which we mentioned in last week's episode as being a possibility. Now that has been confirmed. There's also a first person shooter coming from Respawn. This is not Battlefront 3, by the way. Rather, it'll be something else, Star Wars FPS game. And then finally, a strategy game is being made from former XCOM developers. I gotta say, I am tentatively interested in each of these. If Jedi Fallen Order 2 follows in the footsteps of the first game, it could very well be a winner and I'm happy to learn more about a new Star Wars FPS and strategy game. I mean, I can totally see the XCOM formula working really well for Star Wars. You know, what with Stormtroopers missing all of their shots and all. There is still a lot to be determined here and a lot more for us to learn, but as of now, I'm looking forward to hearing more. Okay, now on to one of the biggest stories out of last week. At this point, you're probably sick about hearing of this, but yeah, Microsoft purchased Activision Blizzard. This is just absolutely massive news on so many fronts, but it also raises like a ton of interesting questions. Beyond the existing contracts, what are the odds that Activision Blizzard games release on PlayStation consoles anymore? Sure, they will support the games that are currently there, but the next Call of Duty, Diablo 4, Blizzard, new survival game, do those games just not come to PlayStation? And if they don't, does this mean that Microsoft Game Pass makes its way onto PlayStation as a new means of letting that player base have access to those games? And then on the Blizzard side specifically, does this mean some of their major PC games could make their way onto console, onto the Xbox platform? Particularly, let's say something like World of Warcraft. This topic has been beaten to death, but I still stand behind the idea that this could work. Other MMOs are on consoles. Other tab target MMOs are on consoles. Does Microsoft's support make the push for this to finally happen? Also, what are the odds that Blizzard games become available on Steam? As part of their PC and console release parody, Microsoft has been publishing their first party titles 
on Steam. So in addition to Battle.net, do they also bring Blizzard games there? And then of course, what comes of the legal situations currently in development against Activision Blizzard? What does this mean for restructuring of the company, for the pushes towards unionization? Are they consolidating and eliminating redundancies? There are just so many questions. This entire situation is all sorts of crazy. There is a lot of gray area here and concerns over things like, you know, Microsoft getting its hands in too many pies and consolidation in the games industry. Although I don't think the monopoly worries are likely to pan out, at least not as of yet. I have read that even with this acquisition, Microsoft is still behind Sony and Nintendo in terms of its market share. So they didn't exactly just buy their way into the number one spot, but they could because Microsoft isn't just its games division and has a whole lot more money that they've got access to than say Sony or Nintendo. I guess on the positive side, this does further bolster the value behind Game Pass. No doubt Activision and Blizzard games will be rolled up into the service. There's the possibility of World of Warcraft subscription also getting bundled with Game Pass. So as a consumer, at least in the short term, this is a win for us. In the long term though, maybe not so much. There are quite a few grave concerns. Um, I guess only time will tell and we'll keep an eye on the situation. Frost Giant Studios is a company made up of former StarCraft and Warcraft devs that are apparently working on a new real-time strategy game that will be officially announced this year. Although we've known about this for a while, the project is inching ever closer to a full reveal and has had some major recent developments. With their latest round of funding, they raised over $25 million, which they claim will give them the runway to ship the game they've always envisioned. Speaking with IGN, CEO Tim Morton said, for us, this funding is a testament that the appetite for RTS remains strong in the global gaming community, and we are encouraged to have leading companies like Kakao Games believe in what we're building and supporting our journey. The extra funding will be used to help grow the team from 30 to 50 people, let them move into a new headquarters, and then add extra tech to boost the game's visuals and performance. While there are few details on the theme, style, or even how this game is going to look, Morton did lay out some of their planned vision. The Frost Giant team is fortunate to have the benefit of learning from our experiences on StarCraft and Warcraft, and those experiences suggest some clear new directions to explore. We're also setting out to make RTS more approachable to players who may have in the past felt intimidated, while still providing modes that can support world-class esports. He then went on to say that players can expect to get their first look at the game later this year, adding that they plan to support co-op, will make sure it's entertaining to watch as an esport, and will include a custom map editor. I don't know, man, I'm really curious how a new real-time strategy game will fare in 2022. Things have slowed down drastically for this genre in the past 10 years, although we still occasionally get the release that draws some fanfare, like I think Age of Empires 4 was a really fun time from what I got to play. I'm going to be keeping my eye on this project for sure, and I'm looking forward to finally seeing it later this year. In a new blog post, developer Visionary Realms laid out their 2022 plans for the upcoming MMO Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. These include a continued push towards a playable alpha and increasing awareness of the game. Because let's be real, besides MMO nerds like ourselves, most people probably don't know about it. To help with this, they intend on inviting more streamers and influencers to play Pantheon. Hi guys. <laughs> Along with spending more time doing interviews with various gaming news outlets. They go on to say that the studio is continuing to grow with them hiring more staff across the board and that they're making strides in securing additional funding. So it does seem like after years and years hearing about this game and seeing its early stages of development, we might actually get the chance to play it this year. I do still feel that even the most recent footage of this game looks a little rough, but such is the nature of seeing games in pre alpha states. Uh, it is far too early to deliver a verdict. And as usual, I hope the game comes together in the end. I will let you know if I am one of those lucky, quote, influencers that they select to check this game out. Um, Here's a crazy story. The PC versions of Dark Souls 3, Dark Souls 2, and Dark Souls Remastered have had their PvP servers shut down for the foreseeable future. Why, you might ask? Well, because a few industrious players found a severe exploit that if you used in the wrong hands could give someone full access to your computer and all information stored on it. This RCE vulnerability was discovered by members of the community some time ago, and although they attempted to make contact with Bandai Namco, that seemed to have fallen on deaf ears. So to help motivate them a bit more, they proceeded to exploit this vulnerability on a live streamer playing Dark Souls, making it publicly visible what 
kind of damage could be caused. Well, this seems to have been an effective method as shortly after the company announced that PC PVP servers were being deactivated as they quote, investigate recent reports of an issue with online services. As of now, those servers are still offline. We'll see how long it takes for them to address the issue and make the game's PVP playable again. It's also interesting to note that this same vulnerability in the game's code was found in the test version of Elden Ring. So, you know, hopefully they get this sorted before that game releases in uh, just a few weeks. By now, you've probably heard the narrative around the latest Battlefield game, 2042, and how it's not doing so well. At launch, reviews were quite poor, averaging scores lower than Battlefield 5, which was the worst in the series to date. In terms of sales, the game landed far below EA's expectations, and the player count has continued to tank, with 2042 now being surpassed by older Battlefield titles. In lieu of all of this, it does look like EA intends to make at least some portion of the game available for free in the not too distant future. No specifics have been officially announced, but expectation at the moment is that a slice of the Portal game mode is the most likely contender. EA has an earnings call coming up on February 1st. They will most certainly be addressing the current state of 2042. And since things are going so poorly, giving investors something to look forward to with a free to play announcement seems like something that can probably happen. We recently got a few interesting details and updates for Witchfire, the upcoming dark fantasy roguelite shooter. One of those updates being the fact that the game is going to be a roguelite. In a developer blog post, they laid out what that means exactly for Witchfire's gameplay loop and progression. To sum it up, hardcore roguelikes say when you die, you lose everything, but hopefully you also learn a lesson. Meanwhile, roguelites say when you die, we do punish you for it, but we also let you keep some stuff so you can unlock and upgrade cool shit that might help you in the future. We are like that and more. Our persistence layer is big enough for us to consider calling the game a dark fantasy RPG shooter instead of a dark fantasy roguelite shooter, but at least for now, we're totally fine with the latter. That is really interesting and exciting news for me. I did not realize this game was going to be a roguelite. I just assumed from all the footage I'd seen that this was a linear first person shooter with a dark fantasy setting. Well, I guess that is not the case, and that is fine by me. The post also mentions that they plan to enter Steam Early Access sometime in the fourth quarter 2022, with the hope of improving the game and following in the footsteps of titles like Hades, Dead Cells, and Risk of Rain 2. It's worth noting that this game is being developed by the Astronauts. They're a small indie team made up of some of the people who created titles like Bulletstorm and Painkiller. Their first title as an indie studio was the award-winning Vanishing of Ethan Carter, an exploration horror game. You know, when I first saw the reveal of Witchfire a couple years ago, I was immediately interested. This game just has a killer look to it. And now, knowing who's making the game, seeing its progress, and learning that it's a roguelite, dude, count me in. I'm down. There was one new game revealed this week, and it is the fourth installment of the Crisis series, currently called Crisis 4, although they do note that this is a working title, so that name may change. They say that the game is in early development and it won't be ready for a while, but they wanted to let the community know that it's currently in the works. I did not think we would be getting another Crisis game, but hey, that's kind of cool. Uh, now I want to touch on the recent releases over the course of this past week, games that are now currently playable. We saw the launch of Broken Ranks, a turn-based tactical MMO, Rainbow Six Extraction, the co-op PvE spin-off of Rainbow Six Siege. Unfortunately, people say this one's not that good. That's sad news for me. Expeditions Rome is out, a turn-based RPG, Hidden Deep, the side-scrolling sci-fi horror game, Planetside 2 had the Osher update, which adds a brand new map, and then finally, and the one that I'm most interested in, was the launch of Mortal Online 2. This is that hardcore full-loot PvP MMO. It's a officially left Steam early access. The game features an action combat system, which kind of reminds me of chivalry. There's a housing system, crafting, hundreds of skills, and an open world that they say is six times larger than the original game. So with the launch, they got an update that added things like new dungeons, bosses, customization options, and some bug fixes from the early access version. And it's currently available for the box price of $39.99, but it's also got a recurring monthly subscription that you'd have to pay after that first month 
month, so just be aware. Yes, this is an MMO with a monthly sub. The initial reception has been mixed according to the Steam reviews I've seen. Some of that may just be down to the fact that the servers have been jammed up these first few days, but also, you know, a hardcore full loot PVP that's pretty janky looking probably isn't going to be for everyone. I gotta say though, the game has drawn quite a larger crowd than what I expected. It's averaged around 8,000 concurrent players. And to put that in perspective, during the early access period, which in practice isn't much different from a launch, people could buy and play it, the highest it peaked was around 1,000 concurrent. So it looks like the full launch version has certainly drawn a much larger crowd. We'll just be curious to see how long they stick around. If I have the time, I'm really hoping to jump into this. We only have like a week or so until Lost Ark launches and that's the game that I'm currently most interested in. In the next like five or six days if I can play a bunch of this and come out with some first impressions I would absolutely love to do so. And with that we wrap up this week's PC gaming news. Like I said at the top jam-packed episode lots of stuff going on. I appreciate you guys. The show's been doing far better than I expected. It has exceeded my expectations. So really appreciate you guys sticking around to watch this stuff. I know there's a lot of gaming news shows that exist. I did them in the past. I took a long break. I'm back to doing them and it's been fun. Um, I've talked about this too as well on the channel. In addition to this weekly gaming news, I want to start doing more recaps, almost reviews or update videos for games. I think that's going to be thrown into the mix. We'll have my news. We'll have the previews of upcoming games and then something along should you play and or reviews and let me know in these comments too what you guys think i'm always happy to get feedback reading youtube comments can be an exercise in futility and uh, drive you crazy but for the most part i try to check up on what people are thinking especially when i ask you so i'm asking you and i will read them <laughs> what do you think of that plan all right thank you as always appreciate you guys support thanks for watching i'll see you in the next one